you, Drew. Um, I, it is a pleasure and honor to be uh, uh, playing the role of moderator for this event. I've been mentored by uh, the gentleman to my right for, I realize it's about 30 years now. <laughs> um, I don't know what it says about all of us. But, um, but immediately to my right is Chuck Spinney, the legendary truth teller, a historian, philosopher, who I, I think it's funny, was hiding behind the innocuous title of staff analyst throughout all this time at the uh, uh, Office of Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon, repeatedly testified before the Congress, extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily prolific gentleman uh, who landed on the cover of Time magazine in 1983 for his truths about the defense budget. He is still as engaged and relevant as all of the panelists are, as he was at the time, even though he is traveling the world with his wife uh, sailing um, and enjoying life. Pierre Spray, immediately to Chuck's right, uh, was, came to the Pentagon uh, as one of, of McNamara's whiz kids and was part of the legendary fighter mafia with Colonel John Boyd and Colonel Everest Riccioni, and was responsible for forcing the Pentagon to accept and not screw up too much uh, his vision of both the F-16 and A-10, which are those who are following weapon systems known as two of the most extraordinary and successful weapons programs in American history. Uh, he was an active part of the military reform movement that created the Military Reform Caucus that had such successes during the height of the Reagan buildup, for example, as having a, a budget freeze. Um, led, it, was a co, it was a bipartisan effort, but led in large part by Senator Grassley, as well as the creation of the Operational Test and Evaluation Office at the Pentagon. Speaking of that office, to Pierre's right is uh, one of the heads, one of the early heads of that office, Tom Christie, uh, who, who came to that position after a 50-year career in and outside the Pentagon. And, and I have to say that when I came to Washington, Tom Christie's name, he was almost like the Wizard of Oz, where you almost dared not say his name, because he was so powerful in his capacity to be behind the scenes in so many successful efforts in um, navigating the Pentagon's bureaucracy. <laughs> Sorry, whoops. Uh, so uh, what we have here are extraordinary minds and experience that are going to help us uh, learn what they uh, have experienced as well as some of their colleagues uh, that are in this fabulous book, The Pentagon Labyrinth. Uh, we have much to learn from all of you. So Chuck, I'm going to turn it over to you first. Before he starts, does this thing work? It does for the purposes of television, but not for the purposes of the uh, right. people in the room. So you need to talk up. Okay, can, uh, all right. Well, uh, this is about the book, so uh, I guess we start with the first chapter, which is mine, which is why the book was necessary. And uh, <clears throat> Winslow Wheeler, the editor, prevailed on me to write it, uh, much against my better judgment, I might add, uh, because, uh, you know, he was putting this together, and I was off on my boat, and I just didn't want to do it. <laughs> but I did it. <laughs> and uh, I started, uh, I didn't initially know what I was going to do, and I finally started asking the question, why why are we in such a mess today that we are? I mean, uh, does anybody in the audience know how big the defense budget is? Take a guess. Anyone? Well, you're both right. It's depending on how you count it, it's somewhere between the high sixes and maybe 1.2 trillion, depending on what you consider to include. Uh, today we have a budget that is larger than in any budget in the history of, of our country since the end of World War II. It's larger than the budget of any, during any war that we fought with the exception of World War II. Yet we're supporting a force that is roughly oh, one-tenth the size of what it was in World War II, but as recently as Vietnam, the Air Force fighter forces is, is less than half the size, or it's about half the size it was in World War II. The Navy is about a third of the size it was. The Army, the Army is probably 40 percent to 30 percent of what it was in Vietnam. I'm sorry, I, I was comparing it to Vietnam. In Vietnam, we were flying on the order of 1,000 sorties a day or so at the height. In, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the highest we've gotten is somewhere maybe between one and 2,000 sorties a month. Yet we're fighting these two wars in Iraq and in uh, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, our forces are, are getting older. Uh, the op tempos are, are minuscule compared to Vietnam and Korea. And, we're, and we've broken the bank. The military's literally uh, uh, stretched thin. Uh, you got a lot of people in Washington talking about, you know, starting another war in Libya right now. 
Uh, we don't have the resources to do that, and you can see the Pentagon is dragging its feet on it uh, big time. They don't want to go in, and they, there's a reason why. They're in enough to go around. And the real question is, why? How did we get into this mess? And, and the problem is, I think, and I try to explain it in the article, is that over the 40 years of the Cold War, we evolved a political economy based on the politics of fear, in which a, it was really a sub-economy in our larger political culture, political economic culture, that became tightly interwoven, a relationship between the defense industry, Congress, the Pentagon, and a whole bunch of hanger-on think tanks and newspapers and things like that that spread out from that. And, and basically, it's what I call the military-industrial congressional complex, and, and when the Cold War ended, without warning to most people, with the exception of one of the authors of our book, Andrew Coburn, who sort of predicted it six or seven years earlier, uh, uh, the military-industrial congressional complex was flat on its book. It, it, was, facing, it was facing a total disaster. It was, it, it, because if you reduce the budget to a normal, and we return to being a normal country that wasn't permanently mobilized for war, uh, uh, it would have collapsed. And so what has happened is that there's strange mutations taking place because the, the web of political connections was so strong. The budget went down initially, but it didn't go down as much as people thought, and we planted the seeds for an explosion in the budget in the late 90s. We planted the seeds in the early 90s for an explosion in the budget in the late 90s, which came out on, on, as, as predicted, and there were several of us that predicted. It wasn't, it wasn't too hard to see. And... Uh, and, and basically, it was because the MIC, the military-industrial congressional complex, had to struggle for survival. And what has happened now is that we've evolved a political economy that is basically dependent on small wars, continual small wars, or the threat of small wars. And of course, 911 turned out to be a godsend for this. We were fighting small wars before 911. We had Kosovo. We were doing the. Uh, 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 Bosnia, we were doing Iraq, the no-fly zone in Iraq. Uh, but of course, 911, you know, from a marketish standpoint, would have been seen as manna from heaven. Uh, I'm not belittling it or anything when I say that, but it it just created an emotional thing that unleashed this, and so we've had this huge explosion since then, which has largely been driven by Cold War weapons having nothing to do with the wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And now we're at the point where the government, the government's basically near a lockdown, the defense budget's untouchable, the military's strung out, we, we've got horrendous personnel problems with, with troops who are being rotated uh, in and out of, of Afghanistan and Iraq, a lot of post-traumatic uh, uh, stress syndrome, and, and these are going to be big problems for the rest of the remainder of our lives. And uh, the question is, how do we get here, and how do we sort our way out? And so I, what I tried to do in chapter one was just to sort of lay out what I haven't described very well here, and, uh, and then I sort of passed the ball on to the others to try to explain why that was the case, and I, I think that's about it. All right. I think. Okay. Slide Garrett. free. Yeah, picking up <clears throat> on exactly that theme, uh, of course, at the heart of the shrinking forces and the hugely growing budgets that Chuck is talking about are the question of weapons, ever more expensive weapons. And it turns out, despite the huge amounts of money being spent, you know, we've, we've basically created uh, a heap of pretty mediocre weapons and quite a number of useless ones. And it's, of course, of the essence to tell the difference between the two if you want to unravel this cycle that Chuck is talking about. Because if you don't challenge that, that prevailing notion that's so convenient to the military-industrial complex that every new weapon has to cost at least three to ten times what its predecessor does, you're doomed to just keep on exactly in the cycle that Chuck described. So that's why it's very important to talk about separating, you know, good weapons from bad ones, sorting them out. Uh, of course, it's of major consequence to the people who have to use them, as you would expect. But it should be something that lots of the rest of us get involved in. Everybody who's interested in defense uh, should be directly involved in, technically inclined or not, on getting to the bottom of the difference between good and bad weapons. 
in order to break this, this cycle that's both destroying uh, the economy and destroying our ability to actually defend ourselves if we ever had to in some serious war.